Okay, so after an east wind blew a big fire and burned the place off, you've got land that nobody considers of value for anything. I mean, nobody wanted it. And so we've got worthless land, and we got snags on it. It's very remote out here in Bearsburg. You know, why, why would people come here? It's remote, it's worthless land, it's got snags on it all over the place. There's too many trees, you got stumps like this guy. It's, uh, these guys are standing, that's Willie Rowe right there, if you're familiar with the Rowe family. Uh, standing up there looking on a stump. Uh, it's not conducive to farming. Our top soil's maybe that deep, you know, and then we got clay and rocks and all kinds of other stuff. So, who in his right mind would want this land? Well, that's the question. Why, why would somebody start Bettersburg with land like this? It doesn't make any sense. So, that's the question. Well, there's a couple of answers here we want to look at. George Weyerhaeuser was an enterprising guy, and he went back east with two of his buddies, and he got over 20 guys to give him some dollars in an investment program. And he came out to the Pacific Northwest and bought 900,000 acres with their money and set up an office in Tacoma and started to salvage some of the burnt timber. Since Yakult was the one that had the most roads and the railroad was being built out to it, he started there as the best place to start getting some of this huge timber in and make, make some money out of it. Even though there wasn't much to be made, he figured there was something. So he saw some value in the land and bought a bunch, okay, 900,000 acres. The land in those days was like 50 cents an acre, you know, but still it was some money. There was a whole bunch of independents who followed suit then. So on the Lewis River, the East Fork Lewis River, there was four mills up there and flumes coming down from the top of Elkhorn and Bell Mountain, water flumes that would bring the logs and the things down to the Lewis River where they cut it. So the, there were several independents there, and the railroad had been started towards Yakult, and they finished it, and that allowed uh, Weyerhaeuser to haul out what he had milled and what he had made up there. And the problem for him was that the USA was swamped with lumber, and so he found uh, people overseas, Japan, China and several other places over there that would buy the, the lumber that he was sending to them. So he was able to make some money. But there was another enterprise, enterprising guy named J.C. Lanerberg. And he had a buddy and they started a company in Portland called the Swedish Land and Colonization Company. And he bought land in Venezuela, cheap land, nobody wanted it. So he bought, okay? Now, he's got a market in mind. This guy is crafty. I mean, totally unethical, but... <laughs> so, he figured his market was immigrants. The immigrants are coming into this country, they don't know nothing. You know, uh, my grandparents didn't even speak the language. They didn't know what a dollar was. They knew what kronas were, because that's what's used in Sweden, but they didn't know what a dollar was, or what it was worth, or whatever. You know, here's these poor immigrants coming in, and this guy, this guy named J.C. Lannerberg, he, uh, he was aware of this and figured he could make a buck, and he did. <laughs> so his market was the Swedish immigrants, and with his noble-minded enterprise here to give them a nice home in the United States, he bought the land for a dollar an acre and sold it for $250 an acre. But the Swedes didn't know. You know, they had no way, they, they couldn't talk with their neighbors or anything, they couldn't figure it out. They thought it was a good deal, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> So, how do you get Swedish immigrants out to Venezuela? J.C. Lannerberg started up his company. He's, he's got a piece of land, and he's going to lure some people out so that they'll buy it. And then he's going to get his money, and he disappeared, which he did. Why did he choose Swedish immigrants? Why did, why did he choose the Swedish immigrants? Well, did uh, he have a connection? Th there's, there's more to the story. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> Down in Cuba, there were some Swedes who moved, you know, yes, real short. Yes, 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 we want this. <laughs> they uh, saw the enterprise in Cuba as they were leaving Sweden, and we'll talk about why they're leaving Sweden, but to raise sugar cane and make lots of money. And so they were down there in Cuba, 
very successful in, ra in raising sugarcane when a uh, riot, a, uh, a coup was occurring where the people of the land in Cuba were taking out anybody who looked like an entrepreneur or was part of the bourgeoisie or whatever, you know. So the Swedes then had to run for their life. And many of them were killed. They were just shot. The, the immigrants uh, down there, they were considered foreigners and they were considered bad guys. They were taking all the money away from the people. They were, and so on. This guy, J.C. Lannerberg's company name was the identical name down in Cuba for bringing Cuban, I mean, Swedish uh, people into, and then he runs for his life and he wants to continue that business. He found a niche business that he could work in. <laughs> because <laughs> nobody wanted it out here if they really knew what it was about. <laughs> well, uh, there were ads printed in Swedish and then tacked onto power poles at all the entry points for immigrants in the eastern United States. So they would tack those up on the power poles and the Swedish people would be walking in with their bags and they would see something in their own language and they'd go, oh, look at that, and they would read. And they'd say, hey, that sounds interesting. They had no idea how far away it was. You know, as you're coming in on Staten Island and you see this, but beside the Statue of Liberty and so on, and to them, you know, it must be just a little ways away. <laughs> <laughs> so part of the ads that went out were testimonials from people who had already gotten here, and uh, the Abrahamson family was one of the first. There were, there were seven families that came in to start with that J.C. I was going to say Swindle, talked into getting in and out here. And they planted, and these are oaks right here, and you can see it's up to his shoulder. So this ground, which had for maybe 500 years, had nothing growing on it, except an occasional tree here and there, because there was no underbrush at all. There was, you know, so forest duff was building up over the years. The ground is getting better and better, essentially, as, as time goes. But then you take the trees off, and you start planting stuff, within three years, that crop was only eight inches high because the soil was used up. There was nothing left to it. It had been used up. But anyway, his, his brochures had, you know, grandiose uh, visions here of how nice this land was, how it could become a farming thing. He had a map here, the Columbia River, and he was showing where Ventersburg was and so on. And uh, just as a quick mention, do you know that you're not in Ventersburg right now, according to the designation of the county as a, as a designated place? The actual Bearsburg in their idea starts on the on 209th here and goes that way with the center of it near Battleground Lake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you go look on the internet for Bearsburg, you'll find that you're not in Bearsburg right at the moment. <laughs> according to them, not according to me. <laughs> so where are we? Hey Tom, Tom, where are we? What town then? It's Hawkinson. Hawkinson, okay. Okay, so another side note. How did Venersburg get its name? Perhaps you've heard several stories. Well, this one is written by my mom, and I consider her an expert. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she was explaining that the name was a morphed word from the local people who, who were first to arrive. And it essentially came from the word van, which means friend, and vanner, which is plural, which means friends. Mm -hmm. And so the Swedish A in banner right here is pronounced in English as a short E as in ten. So it's ven herbs, not ban herbs. So it's veners, as, and so when the Americans wrote it, they put an E in there instead of an A, right? So the Borg part of it, veners Borg, uh, means a haven, a safe place, a castle, a fort. Uh, it's, it's a nice place that you can be safe in. So they thought Venisburg was this nice little valley, a nice safe place to be in with a bunch of friendly people in there. Swedes are social people, and in the area that they came from, uh, especially my uh, grandparents, both sides were about uh, a few, few miles from the Arctic Circle. So in wintertime, you have to get together or you go crazy. 
So they would get together with their coffee, which was so thick you could cut it, and they would sit and drink and eat cookies and tell stories and do all kinds of things during the dark years of, or days of winter. So they were used to that, and so as they were seeing uh, uh, how to name this, they felt like, hey, this is a very friendly place, just like at home, where we got together every night back in Sweden. So they, they put the two words together, and made the word Bennersburg and spelled it in English way because in the uh, Swedish you have to put two dots over the vowel. <laughs> okay, which, which kind of means friends in a safe place or a friendly haven. And so uh, that's a, a, a kind of a side note here. You'll hear other stories. Uh, it's been publicized that there's a uh, place in a city in Sweden that's called somewhat close to Vandersburg, and so somebody was homesick for that, and they renamed this for that. And I'm, I'm going to take my mom because uh, she was here. She talked to the original settlers. <laughs> so we want to take a look at what was going on in the world at that time as part of our part two here. What brought people here? What were the things creating so that people wanted to come here? And so this timeline here kind of shows some things here. This is kind of interesting. If you've done any hiking back in the woods up here, you've heard about the horse racetrack, the Indian racetrack. Nobody, oh man, you guys are missing out. There is a whole world up there. In the Goat Rocks Wilderness area, it is better than going to Switzerland. There are ice caves, there are snow glaciers, there are around, well, I mean, <laughs> so, uh, in, in these uh, early years here, about 1880, um, Great Britain was anxious to claim more territory, and they sent Captain Vancouver and his buddy out here to, to claim land for Great Britain. And so, uh, the United States was also interested in this area, and they sent Gray out here, Captain Gray and his boat, and he was, went up the Columbia River too, in this time frame right here, just a little before 1800. Then, uh, as it's being uncovered today, Lewis and Clark were more on a military mission than they were the scientific mission. They came out here in 1805-1806. Astor's Fur Company came. Uh, then the great battle happened between Great Britain and the U.S. for who owns this land. And so a settlement was made further north, and Washington then was part of the United States. Um, and about 1853, they became an independent from the Oregon Territory, so it became Washington Territory. Battleground happened in 1855, I think it was, where uh, Captain Strong went out and settled a dispute with the Indians, so there was never a battle. That anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, so Indians. Uh, dies on. <laughs> and then there's really interesting stories on that, too. But anyway, set aside. Um, the ability to buy land from them, called the Timber and Stone Act, and it was about $2.50 an acre. They were trying to make some money on it. And so in, in 1902 then, we talked about the Big Yakult Burn, and then this useless land was then subdivided by J.C. Lannerberg and sold to the Swedes, so the first settlers came in here in 1909 thinking this was going to be their haven of rest. I mean, this was going to be the answer to their prayers. This was God's country, and so on. And so, uh, in 1910, a Yakult reburn came, burned out my grandparents' house, um, and 16 others which were there at that time. And the first sawmill down there in Bodine's Meadow was in 1911, the Ventersburg store in this building here in 1912, the Ventersburg churches, one was in 12 and the one was 14, so we averaged them for 13. <laughs> and another big milestone was that the people out here formed their own co-op and started the Ventersburg cannery, which sold products, uh, pears, prunes, and apples under the Bell Mountain name. And then, uh, we'll talk about it a little later here, in about 19, late 50s, early 60s, Ventersburg turned into almost a ghost town as everybody bailed out. So that's kind of a, an overall picture of what's happening at the time frame. Here was the original map layout of Bettersburg. And I, I know it's poor quality, but 
if you can see this line right here, that's 209th Street running right there. Okay, and it turns into Bristol Road now and lines on down to Gravel Point. And uh, Ventersburg store is located right there. The school, this building we're in right at this moment is right there. Ventersburg Church is right there. 242nd Avenue is going right up here. This is 204th, so Jacqueline and Joseph live right there. And so you can get a feel for what it is, but right in here, there's a whole bunch of little tiny plaques that J.C. Lannerberg laid out in the fashion of what they were used to in Sweden. And in Sweden, it was a caste system that was going on. And so people would live inside the fort or the city that was protected, and they would go out during the day and work on the land, which was owned by the landowner, and then they would come back in the city to their house and live. And so that's what they were used to, so he made it look something like that. So right in this area right here is a whole bunch of plats. Uh, Brenda Moore has a house on a bunch of these, and, and the, several of the houses that go down from here down are on those plats. And so if you look on the county records, you can still see those borders. So he laid out a town right here, and this is the, the first layout of Ventersburg. Later on, he bought more land and subdivided it. But it runs over here to 219th, which runs up. There's Abrahamson's up here, uh, Martin's, and, uh, and so on live right in there now. And so that was the first layout. This was you show, show where the, um, the uh, around the corner, right there. <laughs> right on to the it, It's on to it was right on to a ninth, and the, the road is uh, 227th, and then there's a uh, Salmon Creek, a bridge, and then that's where it was. Really? Wow. Yeah. And I have a picture of it here a little later. <clears throat> okay, so we had land becoming very cheap and available. We had an enterprising guy who saw a way to make a buck. Make it off of the immigrants. That's what got the original settlers out here. It all started with a jet stream creating an east wind and man starting a fire, creating land that was worthless and an enterprising guy to make a buck you know, lures these guys out, and so now they're out here. So, we're way out in the sticks. What do we do now? You know, here's these settlers, and so how did these folks survive? <laughs> it's, it's crazy because there were no roads here. They built their own roads, and, and the only path was over the hill and down to Hawkinson. They hadn't got anything to battleground yet. Well, the first thing they tried to do was farm and live off the land. Well. It worked for a year or two, but then the soil was used up. So then, as the, the logging companies came, there were opportunities to go after the logs. Even as charred as they were, uh, the guys would go out and, and cut out and high-grade the logs and drag them into a mill or wherever they could. And then there were mills. So there was, I've got a picture here in a little bit of one on the top of Bell Mountain, a mill, and some flumes and so on. And you could also make firewood, and there were farmers who would pay you to go uh, clear their land. And the, the typical method for clearing the land was to take a hand auger and auger in a hole about that big around, throw in a couple of sticks of dynamite, and light it and stand back. And they didn't have a good feel for how much was needed. And sometimes, sometimes the stumps could be launched way up into the sky. And they broke windows and houses. And, but anyway, the land, land was being cleared. And dynamite was readily available. You could go into a Ventersburg store and buy dynamite. And you could use it. And, and as time went by, after a couple of years, they began to hear rumors of what was happening over near the Columbia River. And Prune Hill, if you've heard of it, had prune orchards all over the place. And people began to find that this kind of soil, as acidic as it was, would support certain fruit trees, especially pears, apples, and prunes. And so they started planting uh, fruit trees out here when they could afford to buy them. And so now they had some orchards, and there was planting of them and pruning them and taking care of them. And then as they began to produce about 10 years down the road, well then there was food processing and since there was no way to keep them other than drying, dryers sprang up all over Bensburg. There were probably 10 when I was a kid that I used to go play in. They were abandoned, but they would just take a log laying inside here and split out a, 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 a 
a member of it and make a, a beam and put some rails up and split the shakes off of a cedar tree that was laying over there and they would make a dryer with metal screens on it and then they would put in a big cast iron stove and they would heat it up and they would run it during the summer and dry prunes. <laughs> and that had a big market because at this point in time when this fruit became ripe, World War I was on. And we had troops overseas who needed food, and they needed a way to keep the food to give it to them. So dried fruit would give it to them and would keep them moving. As well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they had a, an immediate market for dried fruit, and it put money in their pocket. So these folks out here were now self-sustaining. So they not only could grow their own veggies, you know, and live off the land, but they had income and they could start paying off debts that they had incurred because of J.C. Lambert. <laughs> so the co-op sprang up because a bunch of enterprising people here said, hey, we heard about this new thing called canning with cans. And so they, they got the equipment out there, and so a bunch of the ladies were on assembly lines cutting and deep pitting and doing all kinds of things. A lot of people worked in it. So they had some income. So how did these folks survive out here after they got here? They were lured out uh, through circumstances and then uh, tried these things here. So when World War I hit, there was not a big deal here. They were green card people. So they were not drafted, they were not used in the service, and the people found them useful in providing fruit for those troops overseas and other things. When the Great Depression came here, they had already been used to living off the land. It was not, again, a major deal for them. They had to get rationing, but since they were farmers, they got more gas than the guys in town. And they got more supplies than the guys in town because they were farmers, and farmers had, you know, had to produce for our needs. So the Great Depression hit them, but not as hard as the folks in town or other places. Well, when World War II came, uh, all of the men were nearly gone or involved in wartime operations. So here were a bunch of guys out here that heard that Kaiser had come into Vancouver to build shipyards and to build ships for the war effort. And he needed help. So uh, many women, my mom included, uh, became a journeyman electrician, wiring ships and so on. So the men went down to the Kaiser shipyards and got jobs. This forced them to learn English because prior to that time they were still speaking Sp not in Spanish, but Swedish. And so that forced them to learn the language, it forced them to learn money and all the things that are necessary to survive in the United States, including a skill. So ships had to be welded, some of them became welders. They had to be wired, so they became electricians. They became steam fitters. They, you know, these guys who were living out here off of the land, essentially, and refrigerators were starting to appear and taking the dried fruit need away, they found skilled jobs down at the Kaiser shipyard. World War II, uh, things kind of declined because the war effort was over, so they liked the easy life and the big income from the skilled labor jobs. So they left Ventersburg following those jobs. Wherever those things were, if they were shipyards or if they, whatever it was, they could take their skill and market it someplace else. And so the early settlers then are now leaving Ventersburg. And they left without paying off debts. They just packed up and went. And so as a kid, when I was here in the 50s, we had houses and barns to play in. There were abandoned houses, there were abandoned farms, there was a lot of equipment. They just got up and walked away. The income was, you know, five times what they were making here in Ventersburg. So you could go to the city and and you only had to work eight hours and they'd come home and take life easy, you know, instead of farming where you're, you know, all day and so on. So uh, after World War II, uh, Ventersburg declined rapidly. So life had changed and most left Ventersburg. So I got some pictures here. Boy, this sun is uh, making this a challenge. Um, I don't know if I can do any better here. This is a, a tree. This is a guy standing, and the tree is that big around. This is in Bettersburg. So uh, here's a man standing. You can see his face. 
like that. Here's a cordwood saw with its blade sticking into the wood and it is cutting off a sliver that he'll uh, cut up into pieces. Does that help anymore? No. 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 Okay. Next time I'll bring a shave to the window. <laughs> 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 Like this, cutting off slivers. Now, take a look at this tree, how far it goes out of sight. Wow. Oh, oh my God. you know, these things are 250 feet long. You know, laying down there on the ground and he's sawing away. Well, this picture here shows a couple of boys. They're just young guys. And you can see the wood stacked up right here. And there's their saw. They did it the, the hard way, you know, cutting like that. Uh, this picture right here was the sawmill on Bell Mountain by Broughton. Uh, they also went over that way and had a flume and a mill over there. So a couple of uh, shots there of those places. Uh, this is Axel Johnson's house, which is uh, would be southeast of where the Freemans live today. And so if you can see here, there's rows of fruit trees growing. And I remember picking the prunes there. So there's their house uh, right there. And this house right here is still standing. That's my grandparents' house. It was rebuilt after the 010 fire. And the Swedes have no clue what insurance was. So in the loan process, the, the company who uh, provided the, the uh, money for them to buy their house also required to have insurance. They didn't know what that meant. They just signed on the line and away they went. Well, when the fire burned the house down, they came out and told them, we'll rebuild, rebuild your house. So my grandparents' house was rebuilt. This one was rebuilt right there and was totally equipped with everything that was in it. So there was a clock, there was tables and chairs. So they, the insurance company bought all this stuff and outfitted it so there was beds and everything. And so uh, the Swedes were flabbergasted that such a thing would exist. An insurance company would replace them. They thought, you know, everything's gone, that's it. Man, here came the insurance companies and rebuilt for them. It was just a new thing for them. They were excited. They thought America was great. <laughs> and so here's the cannery right down here. Off of, this is 209th right here, Gravel Road <laughs> at that time. And so that's it sitting there. This is the flume up on the side of Bell Mountain that went down to the East Fork Lewis River that my grandfather went along and patched the holes. So that mill that we looked at on the previous slide would mill the uh, timber into, you know, two by fours, two by sixes or whatever. And then they would throw them in the water and they'd come flowing down here all the way down to the East Fork Lewis River where they were batched and bundled and put on the train. And so the biggest one in the back of Rock Creek was 181 feet tall. Wow. If you can imagine how big they built these trestles to get a flume going to send the products down.